And now we have Barbara Babretz. Barbara is the host for the science and education segment. So she has a very special guest today. Stay tuned and let's watch Barbara and her interview. Welcome to the science and education segment of Impact. I'm Barbara Brabitz. Our guest, a return guest today is Fred Breglia. Fred is the executive director of the Landis Arboretum in Esperance, New York. Fred's our tree guy. So we're here to talk trees today. Welcome to the show, Fred. Hey, it's great to be back. Yes, here we are, it's springtime. What a wonderful time to talk trees. It's the perfect time of year to talk trees. So when we're gonna talk trees today, last time was sort of depressing news. We talked about global warming, global we climate did. change. Let's talk about what we can do in our own backyard with the trees that we have. So you've given us a list of some of the gems that are out there that we could put into the yard to make our yard more beautiful to look at, more friendly for wildlife, and of course, uh, good for the environment. So these, what would you call these trees? Um, I would say they're relatively carefree, um, underutilized, and certainly unusual ornamental trees for your landscape. So we're talking about um, trees that will survive our winters. These are not ones that will ever have to really worry about dying from wind burn or so on and so forth. They'll, they'll survive. That's right. Yeah, these are all um, what I would call relatively tough trees. Let's talk first about our, our number 10. How about the Asian white birch? All right. Well, one of the issues with uh, paper birch, which everyone really likes paper birch, including myself. I love white birch or paper birch. But one of the issues with paper birch right now is that there's a, an insect called the bronze birch borer, which is wiping out a lot of the native uh, white birch or paper birch. So um, in most recent years, a lot of times people have been saying, don't plant the white birch. Well, if you want a white birch, there's a, there's a great variety that you can plant. The Asian white birch has all of the same characteristics that our native paper birch has. Um, in fact, the bark is even whiter and uh, extremely, extremely does, does extremely well in our, site, in our zone. And um, what's great about it is that it's resistant to the bronze birch borer. So you're not gonna lose that tree due to the insect attack that plagues, unfortunately, our native birch. So we're gonna go to number nine, one of my favorites. It's a dogwood. So yeah. this is a hybrid dogwood, isn't it? This one's a hybrid. It's um, cross between a Pacific dogwood and a Coosa dogwood. Now, um, the native dogwood, and this is one of the trends why you really want to make sure you plant things that are what we call resistant species nowadays. Because um, one of my favorite trees is the native dogwood, but unfortunately that tree also has a problem associated with it. It gets a, a fungal disease called anthracnose. And um, therefore the native dogwood is maybe not the best choice because you have to possibly do some injections or spraying to keep it alive. So this cross called the uh, Venus Cusa dogwood is uh, a wonderful selection because A, it uh, looks similar to our native dogwood. With those beautiful flowers, beautiful. with the little indentations on the white petals. That's right. And uh, the Coosa dogwood in itself is a great replacement um, and does really well, but the Venus Coosa dogwood gets flowers literally that big. They're oh. like the size of dinner plates. And not just a few giant flowers, but literally covers the entire plant. It's um, extremely hardy. The uh, Pacific dogwood that it's crossed with is one of the fastest growing dogwoods um, and therefore is a very fast grower, does really well in our, in our site, in our, in our surrounding uh, my, you know, climate zones, does really well in a wide variety of soils and uh, gets flower power, probably the top, top pick for dogwoods. Um, let's move on to one of the beautiful trees, crab apples. Now the Landis Arboretum is known for its crab apple collection, both older varieties and the newer ones. This is the cardinal crab apple. Yeah, this one, um, a lot of people, and I had a hard time picking my favorite crab apple, mm. um, which I put down cardinal, but I have got about a 10 favorites. <laughs> so it was hard to do. Um, needless to say, one of the things that makes a crab apple um, a, a sort of a top pick is that um, you're looking for disease resistance again. Crab apples are in the rose family, so any plant that's in the rose family tends to get um, a number of different in uh, insects and disease problems. So we're looking for ones that are resistant. So the cardinal's highly resistant. It gets, uh, and it has everything about it's red. That's the name cardinal. It gets, uh, red, has red leaves, red stems. The flowers come out to be um, sort of what I would call a purplish red color. Mm -hmm. Highly, highly resistant to any of the major problems that are associated with crab apple, like fire blight, rust, powdery mildews, 
apple scabs, flower power high on the list. About how tall will it get in a lifetime? Um, you're about 22 feet tall by maybe 18 feet wide. So it's one of those great anchor plants that you could use in a flower bed or in a yard near a door to give that visual interest right by the house. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great anchor plant. Um, it actually prefers our heavy, tough site. Mm. Um, clay, loam, Got it. rocks. <laughs> You know, take the big rocks out of the hole when you kids, dig it, but the kids small ones playing stay. underneath it, whatever it, it might be. It tolerates it all, does really well. And the crab apple collection at the Arboretum uh, is in peak bloom right now, and all of them are labeled. So if you wanted to um, get a good idea of what other trees are among Fred's favorite crab apples mm -hmm. that, are, that are really tough, come to the Arboretum, take a look at our crab apple collection, get a crab apple brochure. It's a self guided tour of the apples. Go through and take a look and see which ones uh, uh, are your favorites. Well, last year I went and the hummingbirds were all over the crab apples, so it was wonderful to see. So yeah. I got birds and blooms. What a what a combo. What a combo. Uh, let's go next to one that Landis is known for, and that would be the dawn redwood. This is not like the redwood trees that we think of that are sky, sky uh, rockets, the skyscrapers of the western Pacific coast. This is a different type of redwood. It is, but it is related um, to the giant sequoias and the coastal redwoods of the western part of the country. This one's native to China and uh, actually it's the second oldest tree species known in the world. It was thought to be extinct until about 1946 when a forester in China found one last grove of these plants growing. Mm. Um, in the time didn't even know what it was, had to key it out using um, fossil remnants and they later found out that it was a Don redwood. And um, so a new, new tree species was brought to the a table. A new old new tree old species. Very right? old. A prehistoric tree. Species. Prehistoric tree. tree. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, because it's prehistoric, a lot of those prehistoric plants tend to um, be relatively disease and insect free. They um, have survived and became one of the second oldest tree species for a reason. It's tolerant of a lot of varieties of insects, diseases, and soils. And uh, our uh, Don Redwood that we have at the Arboretum was planted in 1951. And it came from the original seed source that was collected from the first China expedition. So that grove that the the planter found, that grove is where your stock comes from. That's where our seed came from. Yeah, and it's yep. here in upstate New York. It's here in upstate New York. It's doing extremely well. It's um, probably uh, close to 80 feet tall. It's got a, a trunk diameter of probably close to three feet. Um, it gets an extremely fluted, really attractive. Uh, furrowed, deeply furrowed bark and trunk on it. And uh, in fact, that's one of the um, great features of the plant in the dormant season, in the middle of winter. Don Redwood looks awesome, looks really good. And, uh, and it is commercially available now? They are commercially available, and well, I know we'll definitely have those at our, at our plant sale. It's one of our signature plants, and um, we try to carry them every year. We'll give more information about your plant sale coming up towards the end. Okay. Let's move on to number five. This is a Tupelo which we think of in the south. That's right. Red yeah, Rage. Red Rage. Red Rage. Yeah, I threw a couple of uh, southern species in there. Um, what's so great about these southern species um, is that it's actually um, got an extremely good northern range. Now, Tupelo is actually native to New York State as well, so we think of it as a southern species, mm -hmm. but some of the oldest black gum in New York State are found right here in, Sar or, uh, found in Saratoga County. Mm -hmm. um, so there's 600 plus year old black gum in Saratoga County growing right now, so that's Tupelo. Now, Red Rage, as we mentioned before, there are there's sort of these mutations, variations that occur on plants, the genetic variability. And um, a lot of times plant breeders look for those plants that have just a little bit different color, maybe a little brighter red, which is the case of the Red Rage. Um, it wasn't uh, a plant that was developed in, in a lab or anything like that. It was mm. a mutation that was found in nature that just had this extremely awesome red color. And that's and, not just during the fall? Well, no, it is during the fall okay. only. Yeah, it's green during the summertime. Green. Yep, yep, and then in the fall it turns red. Now, Tupelo is known for its awesome red fall color. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about a tree that is already known for a great fall color, and that's just a generic black Tupelo. The Red Rage um, is like a, um, I would say, like a awesome black Tupelo on, uh, in, with the neon lights turned on high. It's <laughs> incredible. It is um, probably arguably the most striking red fall foliage of all plants. Really? Um, glossy red. Whew. Knock your socks off red. Vegas red. Vegas red. Awesome. Here in upstate New York. Well, here's another red one for you. <laughs> 
Let's go on to uh, our next candidate, an Autumn Blaze, but this one is an Autumn Blaze pear. This one's an Autumn Blaze pear. Now, I threw that in there because um, calorie pears often got a bad rap, and they got bad rap because they often broke apart when they got really nice looking in your landscape. But that was only one type of calorie pear. That one was called, in particular, the Bradford variety. The Bradford variety was um, a great tree because it was uh, extremely adaptable, and tolerated all kinds of compacted, um, really, really great for urban condition type soils. There's some right out here, right on State Street in Schenectady I'm, where we shoot. I'm sure they, I'm sure there are. In full bloom. Yep. Now the Autumn Blaze, what makes that so great is it has all the great features that the other calorie pears possess. Great ability to tolerate drought and all the other problems and the hard sites that we talked about. But the Autumn Blaze has a fantastic branch structure, so it's never going to break apart when it gets looking really good. In fact, it's the, one of the strongest pears on the, on the, on the uh, market right now. And uh, hence the name Autumn Blaze. You can expect an extremely awesome uh, display of red fall foliage. And in the spring, um, arguably one of the nicest flower sets of any of the ornamental trees. So, so you get two real blasts of color from this you tree. Do. You do. And then you get a really nice glossy green leaf that uh, is there all summer long. And then um, the birds and wildlife love the ornamental pear. It's not really good for, um, for uh, humans. But hey, Great let's feed the wildlife. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, we're coming into the final stretch here, but we have an added bonus. We just don't have 10 for those people out there. If they want more, they've got more. So let's Absolutely. go on to one of my favorites. I love lilacs. And this one is an ivory silk Japanese tree lilac. So this is slightly different than the French lilacs that we know and That's that are right. out there. Yeah, this one's actually a tree form. It'll go to probably 22 to 25 feet tall mm. by about maybe 12 to 15 feet wide. Again, another tree, if you want to call it a tough tree for tough sites, that's definitely um, every bit that. It'll tolerate all kinds of uh, really harsh sites, but again, it'll live in really good sites too. So if you give it some really good soil, it's not going to complain. <laughs> and uh, it gets the same kind of blooms that, that we associate with all of the lilac shrubs, only this one's on a 20 foot, 25 foot tall tree. Um, there's a number of other cultivars out there that are available, but the, um, the ivory silk and the summer snow are probably the top two. Both white. Both whites. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Nice because we see whites are actually kind of an old fashioned lilac color. It's nice to see them come back. Yeah, and they're going to bloom slightly later than all the shrub forms um, that you see, but right around the same bloom time. Now, another exotic we have um, the Shawnee Brave Bald Cypress. Now, again, think of cypress, think of the south, think of bogs and swamps and all kind of coastal areas, and you're talking upstate New York, bald cypress. Yeah, bald cypress um, is probably the most adaptable tree that I could think of. It will live um, everywhere from Florida all the way up to upstate New York, no problem. Um, I've never seen a bald cypress ever have any winter kill. We have numerous bald cypress that have been alive for over 50 years at the Atlantis Arboretum. They do really well in upstate New York. Mm. Um, they can tolerate standing water. They can tolerate full-blown drought. They actually make a good urban tree for street plantings. Because they'll absorb plant. that river, that runoff when it rains, and then they'll kind of just live their life and not complain. That's right, yep. And um, the, one of the national, I think the national champ is in Louisiana, but the state champ in Florida rivals that. So we're talking about a tree that's extremely adaptable, and those trees are living in standing water. Great. So really adaptable. Now we're going to have to pick between two elms here on my list. So let's pick the camper down, ca camper down elm. That's my favorite. Okay. Because it's different than the American elm. It looks not like an elm tree. Yeah, most people would not think it was an elm tree at all. Um, no. I threw it on there again because I get a lot of questions about elm trees, and people think, A, sometimes there are no more elms, which is not true. Elms are everywhere. Just large ones, especially American elms, tend to be prone to Dutch elm disease, a problem. The, um, the Camperdown Elm is actually a European variety, and um, it, actually every Camperdown Elm can be traced back to one weird mutation, like we talked about. Another one. Mm -hmm. um, that was found on the Duke of Camperdown's estate by his gardener, and it was literally crawling along the ground and, um, instead of growing upright. So what he did was um, took some cuttings from it, and what we came up with um, when he grew those on was an extremely twisted, um, what I call the twisted sister of the Elm family. <laughs> really cool. Um, one of my favorite trees. Um, it gets an extremely, extremely twisted nature to it. All the branches contort. Um, it's probably going to be wider than it'll be tall. So it probably, you know, could be 30 feet wide by um, no more than 20 feet tall. 
uh, extremely tolerant of all kinds of soils, um, uh, tolerates uh, urban planting really, really well. And another great thing about the camper down is that it has interest all year long. With leaves on it, looks great, and in the winter time, it's I think it's at its best because you've I got agree. that kind of abstract Picasso type of strange it, tree look. It really is. Yeah, it's a cool year, cool tree to plant year round. Has an incre you know one of my favorite times to see it is the winter as well, and doesn't get the Dutch elm disease at all. So it's uh, great. pretty much immune. So to it Dutch can live elm its disease. life. It does really well. I've seen hundred hundred plus year old ones um, oh, in gosh. in upstate New York. It does great. really well. All right, home stretch here. Chinkapin right. oak. Chinkapin oak. Chinkapin oak. I threw that in there. It's a native. Um, there are so many great oaks. So just in general, I would say oaks are a great landscape plant. Um, and Landis a has, an, has a registered oak collection, does That's it right. not? That's right. We're actually part of um, a collaborative effort to conserve plant species worldwide. And uh, we're the Northeast Oak Collectors for the uh, American Public Garden Association. And uh, we have uh, all of the native oaks growing at Landis Arboretum. Chinkapin I threw in there um, because of all the oaks, um, it probably has a leaf that is the most like an American chestnut, mm. more so than what we call the chestnut oak. Mm -hmm. The chestnut oak has actually, if you looked at the leaf, similar characteristics to an American chestnut, but the actual leaf um, lobes have a slight rounded point to them. The chinkapin oak looks almost identical, only it has a, a true point like the American chestnut would. So it looks like an American chestnut, gets as large as, an, as, a, as a white or red oak. We're talking about a big tree. Big, strong tree. Does really tree. well. And um, there's over 14 different species of oak that we have that are native to New York State, all grown at the Landis Arboretum. And uh, all of them would be great choices for your landscape. Oaks are, can't say enough things good, that are good about oaks. Well, one of our bonus plants here on the list is a bonus plant and isn't even a tree. And I'm talking about Betty Corning clematis. Yeah, I threw that one in because um, uh, people sometimes have issues growing clematis. And um, they can be a little finicky. Sometimes they say relatively good trick is put the, their feet in the shade and their heads in the sun, and they tend to do pretty well. But um, if you ever had a, um, ever tried a clematis and you ever wanted one to just be kind of foolproof, didn't have luck maybe planting one in the past, the Betty Corning clematis is probably the toughest clematis of all. In fact, it's the one that is uh, what I would say, if you can't get any clematis to live, try a Betty Corning. I've gotten it to live. Yep. I can do it. I've had numerous, numerous <laughs> people tell me the same thing. And it's on my driveway, which is a tough site, tough let me site. tell you. Yeah, we have a couple of them in our perennial gardens that are just blasted with full sun, blooms perfectly every year, heavy duty flower power. Well. We have to wrap it up uh, with the Betty Cording uh, Clematis, one of another one that you can see at the Landis Arboretum. Yeah, we'll be featuring them this um, this spring at our annual uh, spring plant sale. So let's talk about the plant sale. Plant sale runs when? Um, well, this year's plant sale is going to be May nineteenth and twentieth. Okay, um, so that's from ten to four p.m. at the Landis Arboretum, right on the ground. Saturday and Sunday. Saturday and Sunday. If, um, if you're driving from Albany, how long does it take you to get there? Um, well, depending on how you drive, uh, <laughs> that might vary a little bit, but uh, we're talking about 35 to 40 minutes. Great. And you're not going to just see the plain old ordinary plants that you would find, say, at Home Depot or Lowe's? No, no. We specialize in underutil underutilized, unusual, and hardy uh, plants, trees, shrubs, perennials, annuals, um, books. We have an incredible variety mm. of gardening books, uh, used gardening books that are uh, available for sale. And... Uh, arguably some of the best baked goods on the planet. Oh, I believe that. Yep. So you can wander the grounds, you can see a tree in full bloom, you can go and buy it, and you can eat a great piece of pie at the same time. You, you can do all of that. What and, a weekend. And so, yep, and there's no charge to come to the plant sale. Parking is free, uh, rain or shine, and um, we'll be there. In fact, we have an incredible variety of um, good plant um, experts to answer any of your plant questions. I'll be there. Uh, of course, all weekend. So. Stump Fred. Come Stump Fred with your plant or tree questions. <laughs> well, Fred Breglia, thank you so much for coming back. I hope the plant sale goes well for the Landis Arboretum. And for those who can't get out this weekend but want to get to the Landis Arboretum, you can check out their website uh, for directions and uh, the collections that are there. Fred Breglia, thanks again. My pleasure, Good Barbara. Good luck. Great. Thanks again. You've been watching the Science and Education segment here on Impact. Thanks a lot. Well, that's it for this week on Impact. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Nick Barber. And don't forget, contact us at impact at proctors.org. We want to hear from you, comments and suggestions. Also, like us on Facebook. 
go to Impact Show on Facebook and press that like button. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week. Proctors, bringing the best in arts, education, and entertainment.